going on four months of revelation. Do you feel like it's been four months of revelation? <laughs> Sonny's nodding and said, we're, we're, we're tracking through here in Revelation. And we're in chapter 9, and what we're not going to do um, is slow down. And because, believe it or not, I know that this is somewhat curious to you, there are other parts of Scripture. But we are going to work our way through the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 9 of 22. Uh, so we're kind of like 40% of the way there, and so we're going to work our way through. Lord Father, we thank you and praise you that there is a word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. Lord Father, we thank you for the teaching that we have in the book of Revelation. We thank you for this guidance, Lord. May we have from you the pureness of your word. And Lord Father, teach us that we may know and we may prepare in the manner in which you have for us. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now I have a question for you all. I thought you'd like this question. During your morning, as you drank your morning cup and buttered your toast, did you possibly give thought to what hell looked like? How many of you were thinking about hell this morning? <laughs> I'm looking at Brian back there like, uh, no, not this week. <laughs> not this week. Um, we weren't doing that, were we? We weren't waking up thinking about what hell looked like. We were probably not thinking about that word at all. We were probably, you know, we had visions of sugar plum fairies and all kinds of nice things that was going to happen this weekend. We didn't have to worry about the bears losing or the cubs losing. We didn't have to think about, about anything negative. We had thoughts of what we are going to do with our weekend time and what is possible. What are we going to do? Whether we're going to do a lot of laundry, whether we're going to go visit friends or relatives, or whether we're going to take uh, and just veg out on the couch. Whatever we're going to do, our thoughts were not about health. on us. See, if you did, I would have been surprised. Hell is not a comfortable thing to think about. And when hell is brought to mind, we have culturized it with pictures of red devils with horns, with pitchforks, tails, and menacing looks hopping around in a fiery cave torturing their occupants. I think if we all would go you know, we would sit around a table and talk about what hell looks to us. I think that's pretty much what we would think about, wouldn't it? That demons and devils would be bouncing around. And we have this visualization of what Satan looks like with, a, with horn and a pointed tail and fiery red and a menacing look on our face. Maybe even a leering look on his face. We really have this vision that has been given to us by the culture. Because no matter how many times you read the Bible, you see pictures of devils. We get near Halloween, boy, we see devils come right to our door asking for candy. You know, we have this image of what hell looks like based upon the culture. And not like the scriptures. If we think about it, and we go to the scriptures and talk about Satan... We know that he was an angel, and he was an angel in heaven, but pride got in his way, and when he fell, he says that his great tail swept a third of the angels down with him. So him having a little stringy tail with a little point on it doesn't make sense, does it? But that he was this great angel. He was, almost, he was a supernatural appearance. That when we think about the characters that are in the visions of Daniel, in the visions of the Lord, in the visions of Revelation, we talk about these unusual looking creatures, things that we don't see on earth, that they would be such with different types of faces and different types of bodies and wings and all these different characteristics. Satan is one of them. Satan does not, in spite of everyone to the different opinion, does not look like any one of us. Can Satan confuse us, deceive us, and give us different appearances? Absolutely. But Satan, being supernatural in his natural state, does not look like we do. He does not. 
But if we think about him going about in that fiery cave, torturing their occupants, that is very accurate. That is very accurate. Tortured souls is certainly a correct account. Great sorrow and pain is continually experienced there in hell. For a true vision of hell, we need not look past the descriptions of Revelation. I think I have this. Um, here's a question that is brought up by a great, one of my favorite Christian writers and, and theologians, is a fellow named G. Campbell Morgan. And uh, Reverend Morgan lived uh, until the early, uh, until about the mid 20th century. But what he wrote is this in his Crisis of Christ. With sorrowful silence and fearfulness of utterance, we approach the deepest darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words of Christ reveal a mystery and represent in mystery a revelation. To them we turn for a theory of the atonement only to discover that theorizing is impossible. Alone in the supreme hour in the history of the race, Christ uttered these words, and in them light breaks out, and yet merges not into darkness, but into light so blinding that no eye can bear to gaze. The words are recorded, and not to finally reveal, but to reveal so much as it is possible for men to know, and to set a limit at the point where men may never know, the words were uttered that men may know and that men may know how much there is that may not be known. In that strange cry that broke from the lips of the Master, there are at least three things perfectly clear. Let them be named and considered. And this is still continuing with Morgan's word here. It is the cry of one who has reached the final issue of sin. It is the cry of one who has understood the deepest depths of sorrow. It is the cry of one himself overwhelmed in the mystery of silence. Sin, sorrow, silence. Sin at its final issue, sorrow at its deepest depth, silence at the unexplainable mystery of agony and agony of mystery. These are the facts suggested by the actual words. In that order, let them be pondered reverently. Sin is the alienation of God by choice. Hell is the utter realization that those cha of that chosen alienation. Sin, therefore, at last is the consciousness of the lack of God, and the God-forsaken condition is the penalty of the sin which forsakes God. Now listen solemnly from that cross. Hear the cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, that is hell, he writes. No other human being has ever been God forsaken in this life. Man, by his own act, alienated himself from God, but God never left him. He brooded over him with infinite patience and pity and took man back to his heart and at the moment of the fall. In virtue of that mystery of Calvary, which lay within the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God long before its over outworking, in the history of the race. Then when Christ was upon the cross and he says, why, why have you forsaken me? It's not at all that he's forsaken me. But in Christ accepting the sin of all mankind at the cross, he is verbalizing the sin of man. For God has never forsaken us. Jesus' own words, I will never leave you nor forsake you, is a reflection of the thoughts of God as Father. He could not be different than his Father. God has not forsaken us. Period. But we have alienated ourselves from God. Now you say, Steve, we're talking about Revelation chapter 9. And yes, because as we go through Revelation chapter 9, then it will be an exclusive description of hell on earth. And it's for us to comprehend within that determination that hell on earth is coming. We should know what gets us to the point that we are in hell. We have to know what the circumstances are 
for those who have fallen short of the glory of God, for those who will not be raptured up with the church, for those who will not be rescued by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. We must know what our cause is to be in hell. And as Morgan so aptly said it, it is our own determination to be alienated from God. And if we don't have a clear understanding of that word alienated, it means a stranger to God. We are aliens. We are strangers from God. God says over and over, even the alien, you know, it's a sweet thing in Isaiah 56, he says that the, even the alien that is in the land who would come and worship me and observe all my Sabbaths, to him will be a, even a greater memorial. An alien means a stranger, a gayer is the Hebrew word, a gayer. Gayer is a strange word. Indeed, the son of Moses because Moses was in Egypt, he says, I'm a stranger in a strange land, named his son Gershon, a stranger. I'm a stranger in this land, an alien. So we go to this portion of understanding, and we go to the beginning of the readings. And you need to know that the last verse of chapter 8 is the introduction to really to chapter 9. So verse 13 from chapter 8 is the first, and the first 12 verses from chapter 9, this would comprise the fifth trumpet sounding. And the remaining nine verses in chapter 9 present the sixth trumpet. Let me read to you our scriptures for the day. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and the power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings in their tail. In their tails is a power to hurt men for five months. And they have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, and the Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Well, we've read about falling stars before, stars rather, before in Revelation, but here we're given a surprise. This star is a human personality, and this personality is none other than the dark angel himself, Satan. It is Satan. He's permitted to open the pit of hell and open the abyss where God confines the demons. And this reference to Satan, by the way, is not a unique reference to Satan. This has all been prescribed. Do you know that Revelation is the Deuteronomy of Scripture? It is the retelling. It is the collection of parts of all parts of Scripture assembled in one place for the understanding of what is happening. Because all of these things have been prophesied before. There is, like Scripture says by Solomon, nothing new under the sun. And here is the interpretations. Here is the collection all coming to roost all at one time. Why? Because this is the end of times. 
and the beginning of times. Dickens said it, this was the worst of times and the best of times. I remember that in the opening words of the book of Tale of Two Cities. But here is the understanding. This is the end of times. This is eschatology. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ is given to John in the end times. Why is it the end times? It's not the end of all times. It is the end of the earthly times. It's the end of life as we know it. In Isaiah 14, it says this. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit in the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Satan's demise was in his pride. As scripture says to each one of us, that pride cometh before the fall. That pride comes. That when we think we're so much, is when we fall. We think of those words of Nebuchadnezzar. He had defeated all these nations, and he stands on the edge of his castle, looking upon all that he has defeated. And he says, look what I've done. God caused him to be like a wild beast. That his hair grew like feathers and his nails like the nails of an animal. And he ate the grass. Because of his impudence, don't think for even a second that he wasn't just a tool of God. And it's when it says, when he woke up from his stupor. And he gave praise to God. Then he was restored to his kingdom. Remarkable that he could have even been restored at all. But the illustration within that used by God that we should know that God is in charge of all things. He is sovereign. Amen. Jude 6 it says and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them since they in the same way as they these indulged in gross immorality and when after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire Never lose sight of the word eternal there. They will forever be in torment. Some people say a good God cannot do that. They're incorrect. Because a good God is a holy God. A good God is a righteous God. And the good God cannot tolerate the insult to righteousness. He cannot accept that. Many years ago, 170 years, 150 years ago, Mexico was ruled by, an, by a European aristocrat called, called Maximilian. Maximilian. And he came as a gentle man to come and rule over Mexico. One of the, because of a distant relationship and because of the intertwined relationships, he was connected with Napoleon and he came to be the commander of all Mexico. And when the person who was called the Abraham Lincoln of, of, uh, of Mexico, Emilio Juarez, came to essentially unite the country. They captured Maximilian. Maximilian was manipulated by many people under him to cause great grief among the Mexican people. He himself was a gentle soul, but he became a symbol. And instead of just allowing 
for Juarez to allow Maximilian just to go back to Europe. He knew that he had to be executed because it had to be a, a complete ideological cleansing. And Maximilian was shot by a firing squad. God, even more so in his holiness, not for ideological reasons, but for his holiness, cannot allow man to spit upon him. For God's word says, God cannot be mocked. And just like the time that he ordered the Samuel to wipe out the Amalekites, so God is come to cleanse this earth of the foolishness. Together, Satan and his minions face this from Matthew 25, 41, where it says, Then he will also say to those that has left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Wow. Wow. What pours out of the pit is initially covered in darkness and smoke. Such a smoke is reminiscent of great volcanoes that billow up their columns of ash. Similar to volcanoes, this pit pours out great power and destruction. How bad is it? How horrible? In Luke 8, 27 it says, And when he came out of the land, he was met by a man with, from the city who was possessed with demons who had not put on any clothing for a long time and who was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with <coughs> chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. The very place, this pit, the demons didn't want to go into. It was so horrible that even the demons didn't want to go into the pit of hell. How horrible is it that the demons who live there don't want to be there? The demons feared the abyss. If the demons feared it, well, you may draw your own conclusions. Let your imaginations run with it. The outpouring of the locusts it is another reenactment of an exodus plague, but one with a different horror. Instead of clearing the land of all vegetation, these locusts have been given a fighter sting would only terrorize those not marked by God. They are not, instead of consuming the land as they were ordered to do in the book of Exodus during the ten plagues, instead, they were called to those who had rejected God to give them such pain that with a single bite, that man was in excruciating pain for five months. Unbelievable. It says, and in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. So horrible is their pain, man would want to die. Let me remind you, I am painting for you the picture of hell on earth. That these men would be tormented, excruciating. Now, it speaks of man in scripture routinely. But it does not mean that women would not be tortured as well. Before we describe the minions from the pit, let's pause briefly to be aware of some important facts. The keys to the abyss are not owned by Satan. The keys to the abyss were given to Satan, as the word says, given to him, which means that Jesus released the keys to give him specifically for this. God holds the reins, 
on all the forces of darkness and routinely keeps them on a very short leash. However, here God relaxes the reins as never before and allows evil to satisfy a voracious, a voracious appetite. You see, evil feeds on its own work. We, if we eat, just get bigger around the belly. But evil, when it eats, gets more evil. And it just grows in evil. It multiplies its evil. It's like an act of sin. That sin builds upon the sin. That if we tell one lie, now we have to remember another lie. That we build a bigger lie. That once we kill, we're taken away from the, the onus of killing. And we're able to kill again. Murder becomes easy. For one who's done murder already. Burglary or theft becomes easy for those who do commit these things. That once you've taken the step towards sin, that once you've committed those things that you're not supposed to, it becomes easier to do it again. And why does the repeat criminal get caught over and over again? Because he has fallen down the slippery slope. That once he's committed himself to sin, that Satan owns that soul and drags him over and over to the same place. David Jeremiah gives us seven correct characteristics of these locusts, and that's right here. Number one, he says they are imperial creatures. Their appearance as horses prepared for battle is more akin to their stature than physical appearance than we've, that we've described by the word. In other words, that they have this imperial look. They have the look among them of a great army. And they are organized. This isn't some random beehive. They are going to march down the world. And instead of devouring the... The, like locusts did before, devouring the vegetation, the image given by locusts is that, that they are such that they will move like an army devouring the lives of people. That they will be de de devouring the peace of people. They will be inflicting this excruciating pain and taking lives. Secondly, they are invulnerable. Man cannot defeat them. Period. They are indefeatable except by God himself. The crown that they're wearing, read in the Greek, and I read it in the Greek, is a stephanos, or a crown of victory. They have victory already. There's no defeating them. Thirdly, they're intelligent creatures. Faces as the faces of men in their battle formation speaks to not only intelligence, but intentionality. In other words, they have a plan. Good grief, they have a plan. They are creatures, supernatural creatures. That even if you wanted to say they're like robots, they're controlled by the mothership of evil. Satan is controlling them and directing them in military fashion to cause their pain and to cause their victory over mankind. Fourthly, they're intriguing creatures. They really are intriguing. The fact is it says that a woman's hair speaks as they do in ancient cultures was a sign of seductiveness. That you will even be transfigured, you'll be paralyzed, you'll be hypnotized by their appearance. Indeed, these locusts will seduce men into allowing them close to be attacked. Fifth, they're not human. The combination of appearance and lion-like teeth make them supernatural creatures. They are absolutely something that we've never seen before. Sixth, they're indestructible creatures. The iron breastplate symbolizes their indestructibility. Of course, they're not impervious to the power of God, but they are impervious to the power of man. And seventh, they are impressive creatures. The, the very, even, even as they come out of the pit, the way it's described, that their noise of their wings is like rain. It's like powerful rain. 
The sounds of their wings as they left the pit is thunderous. The wings were given them to increase their advantage over men who sadly without God will never fly. And Isaiah says that we would be to soar with eagles. But those are those who belong to God, not those who have been alienated from God. See, it's no surprise that the identity of their leader is the devil. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and the name in the Greek he has is Apollyon. Now, according to the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, the Hebrew Abaddon, now I, I could have told you, is an intensive root of the Semitic root. And the verb stem abad means to perish or destroy. And it came up 184 times in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. The word, the Greek, Apollyon, comes from Apolimi, which means to destroy. And we are aware who the destroyer is. His name is Satan. His name is Satan. We move on to the sixth trumpet in verse 13. It says, The army from the east, then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates of color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceeds fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke, and the brimstone was proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, and have heads, and with them they do harm. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hand, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and of stone of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. I just want to go back because I didn't include it later. But in their tails are like serpents. And we're thought of the times when there was a noise in the camp of, of Moses. And people were in rebellion. And they had snakes would go around the camp and would bite people. And people were in excruciating pain. And it was told at that time that Moses should put up the sign of a bronzed snake. That people should look at it that the plague should stop. And once again, a plague from ancient times comes back to live again. Comes back to be an emanation of what God has forced upon us. You see, it doesn't have to be a new plague. It is a plague all the same. As we inspect part two and start in verse 13, we may be surprised that the command for judgment emanates from the horns of the golden altar. And here we have this golden altar. And the part up on here, these are the horns right here. There's many stories in scripture about the horns of the altar. There was an evil general that worked for King David that he told his son Solomon, do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. And he ran into the temple and grabbed onto the horns of the altar. And there, right there, he was slain. 
You see, the horns of the altar represent the power of God. The power himself are in the horns. And so God himself talks about this. That the horns came, the, that the command of judgment came from this. Because the commands from the golden altar represent the power of God himself. That the judgment comes from God directly from this golden altar. It's a reference indeed also to Revelation 6, 9, and 10. If I can turn us back a couple of weeks where we read that the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony in which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Because those people who had dwelled on the earth were the very people who had alienated themselves from God. And this alienation from God had brought down this great judgment. And those who had come to faith through the work and the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are saying, Oh God, we've come to faith. How long will you take to avenge us because they had been slain by the same people. They had been slain by the work of the Antichrist. They would not accept the mark of the beast, and so they were killed for that. And they called out in righteousness, just like King David does in the Psalms, how long will you not go before you avenge us? Here it is. Right now is the revenge. It was apparent that the souls had been slain had no longer to wait for that vengeance. On March, the angels of destruction to judge the world, where a full third of mankind is annihilated. Two quick notes. These angels are not angels of darkness that are minions of Satan. These are not the good angels. These are not the ones like the archangels that have come to do the work of God, that have gone throughout the works and the history of scriptures like Gabriel and Michael and others. These are not the good angels, the ones devoted to God. These are those among those that were swept down with the tail of Satan. Secondly, add to this third that we just mentioned quarter of those fallen, the quarter of the world that was fallen before in chapter 6 and all those lost at sea and dying of famine and thirst. I want to tell you at this point, half the world is gone. Half of the world is gone. Half of the world is gone. I hope that everyone in this room loves somebody that it is not sick. You all have somebody in your life you care about that is not saved, that is not rescued. That if God would say today is the day that when the church is taken up, that there'd be people that we love that will be left behind. God cannot be mocked. We have worked. The angels had been bound near the historical place of great evil, the river Euphrates. Now people would oftentimes, if I said, what is the cradle of civilization? And you know that it's the area between the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. That that is the cradle of civilization. We know that this is near the place where the Garden of Eden, Eden was. We know this is the great river that is talked about in ancient times in the scriptures of the book of Genesis. But yet, I want you to remember this: these things that happened here, and uh, and these things that happened here is number one, the first sin happened there. Number two, the first murder happened there. The first community of rebellion, Babel, happened there, and Babylon was there. All there, there. And if we look back in the scriptures, it says, "At the river Euphrates." This is not indescript. 
but one created with precision. In verse 15, remember, it says that the four angels had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. In other words, there was a prescribed moadim here. There was an appointed time for this attack to happen. The enemies of man were coming out just like so. In, in, incredible. And the numbers of the armies, verse 16 says, of the horsemen was 200 million. It shook my head. At the time that this book was written, the estimates are pretty wide ranging, but they run between, the historians say, that between 200 million people and 300 million people inhabited the earth at this time. The whole earth. If we take the world of knowledge that happened when we say the whole world and we talk about, look at the maps of the churches of Ephesus, and we look at the entire Roman Empire, because the world as we knew it was European and Middle Eastern, it's far less. Because there were certainly people who lived in Asia at that time, in the Eastern Asia. And it says that the number was 200 million. And the totality of this violence has reduced the world in half by its inhabitants. So when we read 200 million in the army of the horsemen, we must remember that this is the prophetical book. Because since the total of the population when this book was written was between 200 and 300 million, how conceivable is it that there's an army of 200 million? The prophecy of this book is the fact that at whatever time it is, that Christ comes back, that revelation starts, that this holocaust begins, that there will be 200 million people in this army out to devastate the world. And that doesn't count the locusts. It just says these are the armies of the horsemen. There's two distinct groups that are attacking mankind. 200 million in the army plus this countless amount of locusts that come out of the pit that are about to knock out a third of mankind. What in the world can we comprehend to expect this? There's deeds, horse-like, breathing fire, consuming everything before them, with tails that were serpents. Tails that were serpents. That if they would get into the midst of battle, they would be breathed on fire from the front and bitten by poisonous snakes from the back. How can we compete with that? The worship of God is absent, save for a small remnant of newer believers. Those who hadn't been God worshippers fell before the Antichrist and became worshippers of darkness. Oh. Henry Morris speaks to the works of Satan here, where he says, stupefying and hallucinatory drugs had been associated with sorcery and witchcraft for ages, yielding to their users strange visions and hallucinations which they could interpret as oracles for the guidance of their clients. Also, they divested their users of the control of their own minds, making them easily available for possession and control by evil spirits. Remember, this is chapter 9. It's the painting of hell on earth. That those that are consumed by drunks in today's culture... How many steps is it for all those who think that we should legalize one drug and legalize another drug and have loose rules about how many steps is it just from that point 
to having drugs being the controlling part of the culture. And then a fool, then a demonic leader, the Antichrist, could easily control people who are not in their right minds. John identifies the four kinds of work of these worshiping idols in tribulation from Revelation 9.21. It says this in 921, that they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. So we identify number one, murders. The Greek word here is phonos. Phonos. Which comes from the a root of the Greek word in a, a, of a term that they don't use anymore in the Greek language is femi. And it means to murder, to slay. And the other Greek term here, the next one, nor of their sorceries. Now, I wondered about sorceries because, you know, I've got all this idea about the sorcerer's apprentice. You know, the old story about a wizard. And it's not about a wizard. It is the word here that they've used to translate to sorceries is really the word pharmakeion. It is drugs. Pharmakeion, right there, is the Greek word used here. It is drugs. And the drugs were originally used by the occult, even in those days, that the Greeks and the Romans had priests that would drug people and put them into a state and say they had healed them. The occult used drugs. Thirdly, fornication. And we see the word that's used there, porneo. Any surprise what that word means? Pornography, porneo. We see the extraordinary sin-filled sexual immorality that the progressives even today are attempting to force on our babies to teach them that homosexuality is just okay. What step is it into this next immorality? And these are the reasons in verse 29 why there's hell on earth. Why? Because of murderers, because of drug use, because of Progressives in the porneia and less than the clement. You want to know where the word kleptomaniac comes from? When there is no spirit holding us back, the evil within mankind just manifests itself to a complete flower. It comes to complete flower. Hell is on earth. Why? For those who say that marriage between a man and a woman is not really all there is to marriage. For people who say it's okay to end life, for people who say it's okay to take drugs, for when they start now with cannabis, when they start now with marijuana, what's the next step? Because once you take a step into sin, you go down for sin <coughs> breeds sin. Finally, <coughs> verses 20 and 21 say that men did not repent. That repentance can only be inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had left men to their own devices. This, my brethren, my family, is the picture of hell. That is chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. And I'm teary-eyed over it. Because doing whatever we want spits in the face of God. And by spitting in the face of God, this is what is being released. This is demon in the future. This is now. Where people can kill and saying, I was insane at the time I did it, let me off. For what person in a right and righteous mind would ever take another life? There's no excuse. There's no good way to do a wrong thing. For our God is a holy God, and he says, 
be holy as I am holy, be perfect as I am perfect, and he calls us to submit to his lordship. And he does it pleading. And he says, see, I go to die upon a cross so that you should never die but have eternal life. Believe on me, he says. Believe on me. Lord Father, I thank you for these intriguing words, these fearful words that tremble, that we tremble at the thought of them. How could we even think? How could we even question? For today is the day of salvation, Lord Father, for all you've given us. Your love and desire for us is that we should all be saved. We should be rescued. Rescued from sin, no. Rescued from ourselves. May we fall at the foot of the cross and say, Yeshua who anoint Jesus is Lord. May we do so with a humble heart and a commitment forever. And may we do this in Yeshua's name. Let's, uh, let's have communion and then we'll do then we'll do the ironic benediction. shine his countenance upon us and give us his peace.